The same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. It gives me great pleasure to introduce this next speaker. Uh, Dr. John Peffer is an adjunct professor at Case Western Reserve University. Also, let's note, an editor of Critical Interventions, the new journal um, coming out, spearheaded by Sylvester and John. Um, John is also a recipient, recent recipient of an Andy Warhol Foundation grant for authors and his book will be based on his dissertation and is being published later this year by Minnesota. Without further ado, John Peffer with Gray Areas and the History of Black Modernism in South Africa. Hi. So we start every section of the symposium today with the same introduction. And thank you to Sylvester Obechi and Art Mbanefo for uh, bringing us out there and giving us this platform. This, uh, I understand at this point in the, uh, in the afternoon it feels like we've been running a, a long distance race or something like that, but we're not finished yet. Um, I wanted to share with you an excerpt from my first chapter of my book that's coming out. Um, I won't read you the whole thing, it's 40 pages, so I'll read you the beginning and the end. Gerard Sokoto's Yellow Houses, a street in Sophia Town from 1939, is a modest painting, one whose small size and innocuous theme belie its importance in the history of South African art. The story of this painting encapsulates the hardships and the opportunities encountered by black artists in South Africa during the second half of the 20th century. It was painted in oil, on cardboard, and measures only 20 by 30 inches. In the painting, three iron-roofed homes connected by an undulating wall line a rocky street. Two figures walk along carrying packages. One exits a corner cafe, or cafe, as they say in South Africa, with his purchases in his hands. The other balances her burden on her head, and a postman rides his bicycle down the rock-strewn road. The colors are all primaries, red roofs, bright yellow walls, and blue sky. It is a romanticized view of an urban slum. Sophia Town was founded in 1899 as a white middle-class neighborhood, but a sewage plant was built nearby, and by the 19-teens it had become a working-class area and home to a congested and vibrant mix of cultural types. By the 1930s, when Sokoto lived in Sophia Town, it had become a mostly black location. Between 1955 and 1960, the neighborhood was demolished by the apartheid government, and its residents were relocated to the expanding, segregated southwest townships. Since that time, Sophia Town, the mixed-race slum on the outskirts of town, has been memorialized as a mid-century crucible for some of Johannesburg's most famous and most notorious writers, intellectuals, gangsters, artists, and jazz musicians. Sokoto's coven, cousin lived in a house on Gertie Street, and the artists, at home during the day while the family was at work, watched the neighborhood from her window above the street and painted the scenes below. This scene was painted from that window. In 1939, Sokoto had just recently moved to the city from the rural north. He was born into, a family of, uh, of, into the family of a Christian preacher in 1913 at the Botchabella Mi uh, Mission Station in Middleburg, an area that today is called Mapumalanga. He studied at Grasdieu, 
an, Ang an Anglican college near Petersburg, and received rudimentary art instruction as an adjunct to teacher training. The traditional people in the area of Middleburg were largely Pedi and Endebele, both groups noted for the use of hard geometry and contrasting tones in their mural art and beadwork. Sokoto, late in life, recalled the, quote, color and pattern in his childhood environment amongst the, quote, non-Christian black people. And this bold application of color and the vibrant play of pattern seen in Endebele murals, as South African art historian Elza Miles has noted, became important features in Sokoto's renderings of daily life in Johannesburg. Sokoto was quickly brought into the circle of progressive white artists and gallerists in Johannesburg who embraced current trends in European modernism since his own style fit well with their reduction of surface to pattern and the expressive use of color then in fashion. His nephew introduced him to brother Roger Castle, then an art teacher at St. Peter's Secondary School in Rosettenville. At St. Peter's, he was given lodging and studio space, and he met Judith Gluckman and Alexis Preller, two young white artists associated with the progressive new group. Sokoto painted alongside Preller at St. Peter's and was taught the rudiments of work in oil in Gluckman's studio. In 1940, he was included in a show of landscapes by 22 artists. In 1943, he was invited to exhibit with the new group for their fifth anniversary show. And in July 1947, he was given a solo show, and all of these were at the Gainsborough Galleries in Johannesburg. During 1944, Sokoto spent a year in Cape Town living near District 6, a neighborhood whose cultural flux, racial mix, and later demise was very similar to Sophia Towns. There he exhibited alongside the sculptor Louis Maurice and was, according to some observers, very impressed by the expressionist paintings of Maggie Lobsher, who had lived herself in Berlin in the 1920s. Through these experiences, Sokoto was exposed to the work of white South African artists who themselves followed international trends and through them to the major styles of European modern art of his day. Yellow houses with its intense use of color, its quickly sketched figures and nervous lines, and its romanticizing attention to the details of everyday life among the working poor is also reminiscent of the work of Van Gogh, whose work Sokoto admired, and more distantly, to the contrastive patterning of traditional murals. The painting also evoked the lives of those living on the edge in South Africa's Golden City during the 30s and 40s. As a Christian from the rural areas, as a newcomer to the city, and as a novice in art, Sokoto was in many ways an outsider. His art, he claimed, was a means to seek himself, to understand by expressively recording the life around him. Uh, and this is a quote uh, by Sokoto. The conglomeration of all those races, both in the city and Sophia town, he said, was a great upheaval to me, and my excitement at being in this new world caused the directions of my thoughts to be very mingled. In Johannesburg and Cape Town, Sokoto sought to make sense of the vitality of life in the city by illustrating the novelty of his environment. At first, he approached this newness with the eyes of a visitor, and thus as a theatrical scene, in a sense, and he commented later, quote, all of these various types of people, women with baskets of shopping, some carrying baggage on their heads or shoulders, men of various styles of walking and clothing. There were also many children of varied appearance and attire and expression, unquote. The characters and scenes that Sokoto depicted included street sellers with their donkey carts, residents of men's hostels and their bunks, men shopping, I'm sorry, women shopping in colorfully printed dresses or washing clothes in courtyards, morning commuters on trains and bicycles and prisoners on parade. He also sketched portraits of his family and friends at home and of the private lives of the literate black Christian petty bourgeoisie, that is, the incipient cosmopolitan black middle class in urban South Africa. These were scenes of black life in the city that were unfamiliar to the majority of white South Africans, whose image of the black townships was uh, as a place of decadence, overcrowding, and unsanitary conditions. And Sokoto painted these places in a positive light, with an angle of vision that was usually at eye level or from the back, but never invasive. The city of Johannesburg was only 50 years old when Sokoto himself arrived there, having been built from the ground as a mining town after the Witwatersrand gold rush of 1886. Even though it was termed a European city, at mid-century, most of the people of Johannesburg were outsiders, visitors, or recent arrivals. 
The rich and poor, black and white, English, Afrikaner, Chinese, South Asian, and other groups that commingled there viewed each other, at least initially, with what Roland Barthes might have called the eyes of a tourist. In any city, recent arrivals come initially as strangers. Each new thing and each new type of person encountered is at first viewed as a sign of itself. Novel persons and environments start off as representations with more surface than depth and the process of making sense of them tends to unfold the strange into the patterns of the familiar, that is, into picturesque types. Though he initially viewed the city through the eyes of a visitor, Sokoto's sense of remove was also filled with curiosity, and he was a keen observer of the surfaces of everyday life. The images he selected for depiction were, were part of his personal exploration of the novelty of urban life. They were also experiments with modernist styles. That said, for the white middle-class patrons, critics, collectors, and artists who constituted his main audience in South Africa, he was seen as a talented but primitive Bantu artist who represented the everyday life of blacks in town in a manner that they found palatable. In, 19, in 1940, the South African Academy included yellow houses in its prestigious annual exhibition without placement in the usual uh, separate native exhibition category that had been set aside for previous work by black artists. The painting was subsequently purchased by the Johannesburg Art Gallery and became the first work of art by a modern black artist to be collected by a major art institution in South Africa. Sokoto left for Paris in 1947, the year before the election that brought the Afrikaner nationalist government to power. He never returned to South Africa and he died in France in 1993. Nevertheless, Sokoto was remembered as the father of black modernism in South Africa and he remained a role model for future generations of black artists. Yellow Houses and other works by Sokoto from the 1940s are hybrid objects on several levels. They were vehicles for the artist's self-exploration in, in the urban life of the modern colonial world. They were a means to share in the middle class world and the worldliness of white South Africa. They were a method for representing the experience of black people in the city in a positive light, both for themselves and for his white patrons. And they represented the stirrings of a modernist art that would hold the kernel of a crucial alternative to the authoritarianism and the separateness of life under apartheid after 1948. Sokoto's desire for advanced knowledge and training were frustrated in South Africa because the art schools were not open to black people. That said, Sokoto was afforded a kind of access that was exceptional for a black person of his time. Within the circumscribed social world of progressive artists in South Africa with whom he exhibited, Sokoto shared studio space and learned about modern art a continent away. In the years after he left for Paris, apartheid policy made the segregation instituted during the colonial period even more severe, cutting off most avenues for interaction across the color line. And yet opportunities for exchange among artists increased over the following decades as a, number, a growing number of black artists found their way into the galleries. Sokoto's portrait of a young man reading from 1946-47 is both a formal study and a poignant document of domestic life in Eastwood, the black township in Pretoria where the artist lived with his family from 1945 until his move to Paris. The man is neatly dressed in slacks and shirt sleeves. One elbow rests in his lap and the other props up his body on a pillow. He's relaxing on a traditional grass sleeping mat and silently reading from the pages of an open book placed on the ground before him. The colors here are bold, whites, yellows, and blues, and the composition is built up from a series of angles that cross the rectangular frame of the picture from left to right. All the lines cross the picture plane in sharp angles. The corner of the mat intersects with the left edge of the painting, and the man's elbow and knee are set in opposite triangles that give vitality to his relaxed posture. Though the picture is naturalistic, the application of color and line are reminiscent of the mural art of traditional homesteads. This image of a man engrossed in study is non-threatening and its political dimension is left only implicit. The painting welcomes the viewer into the heart of a home, uh, as a, uh, of a private home as a guest and not as a voyeur. Portrait of a young man reading, illustrated with deceptive simplicity, the ease with which modern education and vestigial aspects of traditional African culture could and did coexist within black homes in South Africa at mid-century. More importantly, it showed how natural and not foreign 
access to a Western style education could be in the context of black domestic life. Sokoto and the subsequent generations of black artists who followed him shared a common perspective about the uses and nature of modernist art practice. The colonial view of the so-called educated natives was that they had assimilated to a European culture that was presumed to be universal. The corollary, uh, the corollary colonial notion that an African essence might be contaminated through the acquisition of too much knowledge of Western culture was further hardened into, into, into law uh, during the apartheid years. Black artists who sought advanced art uh, training for their own ends were continually frustrated under this contradictory system. And yet black artists in South Africa, as elsewhere on the continent, viewed the techniques of modernism as a skill set that could be acquired in order to build a relevant local culture that was modern, but not necessarily European. In the years after Sokoto left for Paris, subsequent generations of black artists reiterated his iconography in more hackneyed forms. These artists, who were also likely to be sole breadwinners for a large extended family, had to work within the constraints of the market demand for exoticism and self-representation and the individual need for an outlet for self-expression. But, as David Kolawani has suggested, by considering white patronage as the only or ultimate factor influencing black art production, one does not allow for the possibility that artists could produce an art that appealed to bourgeois taste but was also critical of the status quo. Representations of and from black townships in this sense shared an aspect of deformation of mastery as identified in the art of the Harlem Renaissance by Houston Baker Jr. That is, it mimicked and sometimes subtly reworked the master's code of white patrons' expectations. And I think we should go further and argue fo following Ivor Powell's suggestion that black artists used modernism and perhaps even uh, self-primitivizing imagery as a way to share in the culture of the colonizer at a time when apartheid ideology explicitly denied and violently suppressed any such signs of an incommonness of cultures. Along these lines, the art scene in South Africa might be characterized as what I have termed er uh, elsewhere a dilemma of opportunity. With that in mind, and with over a decade of research into the topic, I have concluded that black South African modernism, despite um, some accounts, did not develop wholly as a product of what the National Party used to call own affairs. Every tribe has its own culture and own language and so forth. That term was used to describe an apartheid fantasy of separate development in which every ethnic group could be assigned a distinct geographical location, could be dressed up in the outward signs of political autonomy, and could preserve its unique national culture. In my view, even though penned in by the burdens of representation and commerce, the stylistic and formal aspects of modernist black art in South Africa should be recognized as media for crossing cultural boundaries. This was also true of the work of white artists. Progressive, artists across the divide, uh, progressive art across the divide was often made in social spaces deemed suspect by mainstream South African society. To borrow a term from the apartheid lexicon of the 1980s, the black art scene in South Africa was a gray area. After June 1986, in an act of appeasement seen by many as a sign of failed policy, the government repealed many of the laws that had enacted petty apartheid. Group areas legislation was gradually withdrawn and public facilities began to be integrated in South African cities during the 1980s. One public concern at the time was the rise of the so-called gray areas, places in cities that were not officially zoned for either exclusive white or black residents. Some worried that government would eventually initiate forced removals of black families from these parts of the city as it had earlier in Sophiatown. Others saw this as an official encroachment upon former, quote, white areas of the city and as the death knell for urban apartheid. Symbolically and to some extent practically, these gray areas spelled the beginning of the end for the officially separate geography of apartheid. Likewise, the gray areas of art in South Africa imagined post-apartheid before it even happened. If one were to extend the sense of the term back in time, before the liberal political turn in the early 1990s, Gray areas also aptly describes those locations within South Africa cities that were never successfully forced into the apartheid division of space according to racial groups under the urban areas uh, legislation. 
These were the, near, the neighborhoods like Fordsburg, Jeppe, Mayfair, Newtown, Bromfontein, Dornfontein, Crown Mines. There were a lot of them. Troyville, Heelbrow, and Yeovil in Johannesburg, and District 6 in Woodstock and Cape Town. All had been settled by working class people of all races and were bohemias for artists, students, and revolutionaries. Many of South Africa's artists felt freer to live, work, or socialize in these places. Sokoto, for instance, had lived in the mixed race slums of Sophia Town in Johannesburg and also in District 6 in Cape Town. In these places, he experienced the difficult pleasures of interracial interaction within the frame of art at a time when such exchanges were still quite rare in the rest of South African society. Poly Street, Dorke House, Market Theater, Fuba Academy, Alex Art Center, the Community Arts Project in Cape Town, and other schools and venues like these where black artists trained or performed were all located in or near the unsightly edges of the white cities, that is, in these gray areas. During the 1980s, the Market Theater and Gallant House in Newtown hosted art openings, leftist theater, musical events, and so on that uh, presented similarly precious opportunities for the mingling of bodies and ideas despite the official racial divide. During the 1970s and 80s, overtly political protest art and people's art was also made in gray areas. And for instance, uh, one instance of this would be Stephen Sachs' underground poster workshop at the Crown Mine Settlement. In the alternative press, Nat Mikasa and si uh, Barney Simon's literary magazine, The Classic, was, from 1963 to 1968, the place to find leading edge writing and art by persons of all races. During the 70s and 80s, that role was taken up by the non-racial staff writer magazine, which had a more populist progressive political inclination. In retrospect, much of the formally interesting and historically important art in South Africa since the 1930s has been produced in these edgy gray zones. The term gray areas may also be loosely applied to the social lives of black artists in South Africa. The term would then be descriptive of artist collectives like the New Group in the 1930s, the Amand Lozi Group in the 1960s, and Afropix and Scuzo in the 1980s. Mixed exhibition openings at galleries like Gainsborough, Adler Fieldling, uh, Leachy Gallery 101, and Goodman Gallery, as well as the studio experiences shared between individual artists were also gray areas. This aspect of the social world of black, of black art uh, was noted early on and perhaps overly optimistically, I would add, by an anonymous New York Times reporter in a review article titled Art Under Apartheid in 1965, uh, which noted that <laughs> zero minutes, I don't understand. <laughs> Under the, quote, iron, ironclad apartheid laws, the ring of racial separation is complete, except for one link. This is the New York Times article. The link is arts. There is no bar, whatever, to the free mixing of blacks and whites at art exhibits. In fact, the best known, most admired, and most sought after figurative sculpture is, in fact, a Negro, Sidney Kumalo. Social events and parties involving artists, writers, and musicians were precious venues for interracial dialogue, especially after the implementation of the Separate Amenities Acts. For instance, Paul Stopforth recalled the beatnik parties held during the 1960s and 70s in Bromfontein near the University of the Witwatersrand campus. He specifically remembered Ezra Lachai and Ben Arnold as regulars on the party scene. Black artists hung out with white students from the university and they sometimes slept over when it was unsafe to travel back to the black locations at night because of the, the danger of encountering the police or gangsters. These parties were held by students and artists in the decrepit former mansions of the wealthy robber barons from the turn of the century in Johannesburg. One of these favorite spots was called just The Pad, a huge house that contained a ballroom where a young Barney Simon also staged his first plays the pad was a precursor to um, Barney Simon's Market Theater, uh, opened in 1977, I believe. At the time and at these get-togethers, claims Paul Stopforth, quote, we were radical in a social sense, if not in a political one. This kind of flaunting of the color bar was a kind of bohemia for white students, but it was more like living dangerously, dangerously for black artists. Even as the larger society that surrounded and including them was bif bifurcated along racial lines, the, the multiracial art scene was the place to hang out if you were hip at all during the 60s, 70s, and 80s in South Africa. The art scene was a, a way to bridge the otherwise tense social gap between the races and as a way for men and women who were legally set apart to hook up. 
Part of the pleasure of that revolutionary period had to do with pushing the edge of the law just to stay human. These instances of close fraternization invigorated the arts in South Africa. Polly Street organizer Cecil Skutnis um, credited them with inspiring his own practice. Louis Machabella, also, who, who also worked at Polly Street, recalled similarly, um, even way back in the 60s, artists were the only community that could be on a first name term across the color line. <laughs> Almost done. Testimonials like these give texture to something rarely highlighted by historians of South African art. That is, that there were debates and discussions on more or less equal terms between black and white, and that these were still possible in the art world even long after the, dr the draconian days of apartheid had begun in the 1950s. Cultural types became bearers, claimed Paul Stoffworth, of the tradition of free thought and cultural mixing that had been cut off at the throat so that these things could be continued and carried through despite the political situation. Finally, and perhaps most crucially, the styles and forms of South African art performed the most delicate work of exploring the gray areas of cultural hybridity. As if to underscore this point, Zeke and Pashlele, in a forceful denunciation of Sangora's negritude at the University of Dakar in 1963, even went so far as to argue that such formal exper experimentation was a form of cultural exploration essential to the vitality of all African peoples in the modern era. Quote, this synthesis of Europe and Africa does not necessarily reject the negroness of the African, he declared, adding, if African culture is worth anything at all, it should not require myths to prop it up. This imaginative synthesis, he argued, had political implications, since the artist never waits for that political kingdom to come. He goes on creating, he said. Our music, dancing, writing, and other arts reveal the cross cultural uh, the cultural cross impacts that have so much influenced our lives over the last 300 years. And it is exciting, if often excruciating, to be the meeting point of different cultural streams. So in conclusion, as a space for communication, art and the social world around it did not always nor completely bridge the gaps of cultural knowledge or political and economic power between segregated definitions of black and white and colored and Asian communities in South Africa. But closeness through art, alongside a painful distance between communities defined by race, continues to be a relevant description of the South African art scene today. We should be cautious then before stating too euphorically that gray areas inverted all of the abuses and colonized mindsets of apartheid. It is more accurate to say that art making and the social world of the arts, especially black art, which is to say the multiracial art scene, proposed the parameters of a post-apartheid world in advance. It was within this often very exciting mixed context, despite and across aesthetic, racial, and geographic boundaries, that much of the modernist art by black artists was produced. A history that sees art as central to the struggle for representation in South Africa should begin here. Thank you. Our second presenter on this panel is Nick Bridger, who is an independent scholar with associations with De Anza College. Uh, the title of his talk is The Rede Rediscovery of Religion in Contemporary Nigerian Art History. Now I really have to start by thanking Sylvester <laughs> and uh, all of you, my colleagues who've uh, borne up and a very long program and we've made it. Uh, but I have to say about uh, Sylvester, uh, his incredible uh, charisma drawing students here uh, ran up against five o'clock Friday and they're gone. So he, he, he couldn't, yeah, you couldn't, but five o'clock Friday is, you know, we just, uh, and I wanted to thank, of course, Mr. Art uh, Bonifo, uh who couldn't be here. And could you remind us of why he couldn't be here? I see. Kind of a segue for me. Uh, uh -huh. Thank you. And uh, this is uh, uh, this presentation is, is a slide presentation. Uh, I won't be reading my paper. I uh, realized the time um, didn't permit it and went to a slideshow that uh, will have a lot for you to read, and I'll I'll be going along with you. Uh, 
so it's rediscovery of religion in contemporary Nigerian art and religion here refers to primarily Christianity um, but other religions as well sometimes uh, this is a narrative slide presentation it's based on uh, my experiences of entering art history recently I've spent my career teaching world history and anthropology and about 10 years ago uh, decided to follow my passion into first art history world art then into African art and uh, closer and closer to a topic that uh, I love to this day and uh, this is uh, not directly about my topic but about something I observed on the way to my masters so uh, this kind of uh, is sort of the graduate student process uh, uh, you start looking at this amazing world of things and my preference was always for world versus European world art as it's called uh, and gradually I realized if I was going to do Africa I had to get real narrow and figure out which one of the thousand different cultures would I focus on and what was possible um, in the 90s uh, there was kind of a flood of work on the Yoruba and uh, it appealed to me intensely and I thought great uh, I've solved all those problems of selection I just have to look through what's been going on maybe the last 50 years because you know I was teaching and, and going back to, I was teaching full-time high school and going back for my masters um, in the evenings and uh, really couldn't travel and do extensive field research at that point and so I was looking for a doable topic uh, and so I thought oh what a rich uh, cultural field let's find out and I came up with uh, something called the Oye Kitty Workshop uh, it was a Roman Catholic missionary institution and uh, I have a Catholic background and I thought oh good I used to be interested in church history as a kid this will be great that'll kick in in my own personal background uh, so then what happened uh, my advisor said okay when I come back from leave uh, from uh, I think she she went to another university for a year uh, have your thesis outlined for me and I go okay and uh, so here we see uh, Kevin Carroll in the center some uh, doors uh, that were carved part of the product of the Christian workshop of Oye Kitty and one of the buildings I was there last summer uh, that still exists I soon found out that uh, the primary sources, I'll use kind of historical uh, jargon here, primary sources were uh, two books written by Father Carroll. Uh, he was quite a literate, uh, very academic type guy. And uh, the architecture's book was not of interest right away, but definitely the uh, 1967 one on Yoruba sacred carving was the source for me. The other uh, source uh, which came out right a little bit before I uh, decided on this topic was by the main li the only artist I knew of who was still alive from the workshop Lamidi Fakeye and he had uh, there's a picture of Lamidi from last summer and he's in good health and uh, so I had two sources so now we look for secondary sources and I uh, started looking and then I started getting more desperate and then I started ransacking the library at UC Berkeley and I couldn't find any significant secondary sources here's uh, Frank Willett's book uh, just had a little dab on the OE Kitty workshop and uh, uh, virtually turned up nothing and uh, so I was desperate my uh, advisor came back and wanted to know what I was going to do and and almost simultaneously I heard from a man Duncan Clark in London that they father Carroll's order father Carroll had died in 93 but his order by 2000 2001 had opened an archive in Cork of his files and his hundreds and hundreds of photographs of the art that uh, he had patronized and that he loved um, and so I was saved 
and so uh, in the summer I or at Easter I went over and did uh, a very intense look at this archive and uh, got plenty of great rich material for a master's thesis. There was enough for a dissertation, believe me. Um, but I realized something, and that is a huge question. So you can put it two ways. How do you explain this dearth of published scholarship? Uh, why was African Christian art and artists so scarce as I crawled through the Berkeley Library? I couldn't find anything. Uh, so what is missing? Is it the subject matter? Is there really no Christian art around or very little or is it just minimal? Or is it there's no interest? And so I had that question. Um, I was happy to get my degree. And so the first part of it, uh, a shortage of Christian art, I soon found out, uh, you find it in the most unusual places. It's not in books that say Nigerian Christian art or uh, something like that, but it would just pop up. So here's uh, Uchi Okeke, uh, a Christ uh, picture that we saw something very similar earlier. Uh, yes, and uh, it just, these things just jump out at me. Uh, this modernist doing Christian art and we tend not to put those two together. And so I found a Time Magazine cover article by Richard Osteling, who is the senior Time correspondent, uh, still alive today, uh, who interviewed Father Carroll and a number of African Christian artists. And he said, not since Europe's Renaissance has such a large and varied body of Christian art been produced. And that was 1989. And uh, so I thought, well, that's interesting. <laughs> uh, how come I can't find it? So are there really no artists around? Well, my uh, trips to Nigeria have uncovered a bunch. And I'm just looking in my narrow field of Father Carroll's Yoruba Christian art. And uh, had a wonderful time with Bruce Onabrak Peya, who's a robo. But uh, he, he talked for 10 minutes about Father Carroll being so significant and, <laughs> you know, without stopping. Uh, down at the bottom, a lady I didn't know existed who makes uh, liturgical textiles, influence of Father Carroll directly, and Salabi. Uh, Joseph Agbana and his son, uh, who are very active in producing materials for churches in Yoruba land. And then at the top, a picture I really treasure, it's uh, Lamidi Fakeye over on the side. We went driving around uh, all the places. John Picton gave me a marching list, uh, inventory, Nick, you have to go to these places. And so Lamidi was nice and supplied the car and we went traveling all around and we went back to Oya Kitty after 50 years uh, and we found these two people who both worked with Father Carroll in the workshop years and years ago. Joseph Ojo, 84, and his wife Comfort Ojo, a textile artist uh, and head woman's weaver from the workshop. She's 82. And uh, so we've got the artists and we've got the art. Uh, this is from uh, the uh, rather important book that Akasa shepherded uh, Monica Visona and others put together this wonderful book called a history of art in Africa. The only Christian art really featured happens to be Ethiopian Christian art from 325 um, Aksum and up till around 1700 it ends. And also Congo Christianity, which uh, dates from about 1492 or 1495 through uh, around 1700 when that faded out. Uh, nothing since. Um, somebody mentioned this uh, very good book by Professor Casphere uh, has very, very minimal uh, references to Christian art in contemporary Africa. There's some, it's very scattered, but there are a couple of paragraphs and a couple of photos on Father Carroll. But of course, these are big surveys, um, and that's about as far as the literature goes. Uh, my favorite organization, ACASA, which had a wonderful conference, and I've been to a number of them, uh, they have uh, not really attended much to <clears throat> uh, 
Christian art in Africa. I'm unaware of any panels before. This year we had a double panel. Alicia, Alicia Rennie uh, wonderfully put together it and I just reprinted it there. Um, my favorite magazine, uh, I found in a scan, I didn't do, I didn't look at each copy, I looked at their list of articles over the last 40 years. They have two that are identifiably uh, about Christian African art, two articles in 40 years. And you're saying, well, so, well, there are exceptions. Uh, this uh, wonderful book, uh, uh, anthropo Anthology of African Art in the 20th Century, had uh, s uh, a nice uh, article. John Picton uh, had a bunch of pictures of the Oye Kitty workshop. It was entitled uh, Neo Traditional <laughs> Sculpture, even though it was all Christian art, but it, it nevertheless showcased it uh, nicely. These two uh, books also have shown up recently. Uh, the one on the left is about American visual, uh, the visual culture of American religions uh, by Daniel Morgan and Sally Promi, uh, dealing with American art history where religion has not been attended to. And uh, the Roberts, uh, who may or may not be there tomorrow at the Fowler when we go, uh, will be there. They put out this book on Islam, uh, but uh, as you can see, things are a little scarce in this field. Uh, so the subject matters there. Why is there so little scholarship? And I really couldn't figure it out, and I ran a bunch of ideas by myself. Uh, is it anti-religious bias in the academy? Is there anti-Christian bias? Is it anti-Catholicism? You know, as a Catholic, God knows there's, there's a lot of reasons I feel upset about the Catholic Church. Uh, I can only imagine people outside. Or is there something bigger? And I realize all these things may come into play. Uh, meanwhile, we have to step out of our little profession, and we are a little slice. Um, big things have been going on on the planet. Um, I got some statistics down at the bottom. There are 2 billion, 2.1 billion Christians in a world of 6 billion. That's almost one out of three. And half of those are Roman Catholics. Um, this book uh, turned my head around uh, quite a bit. Uh, Philip Jenkins uh, popularized a lot of data that was there if you study about missiology or African Christianity. In other words, you go into the field of religious studies, you will then find lots of data, but nothing about art. And uh, the, the huge tectonic shift that was going on um, for the last 50, 60, 70 years in Africa and in the world, Asia and Latin America, Christianity, uh, the majority of Christians now live in the Southern Hemisphere, while Christianity is collapsing in Europe, uh, post-Christian Europe. Uh, these were some tables, some statistical tables. We find that the explosive growth of Christianity in Africa went from 9.5 million in 1900. 100 years later, there are it, it's approaching 400 million uh, now. Those uh, statistics are almost a decade old. Um, and 50 million Christians plus in Nigeria. These are staggering numbers not to show up in the art historical record. Uh, and in my research, I had to ask, where does this go? Where, what, uh, and kind of push it back. What's behind this Catholic art that I found? And uh, the uh, uh, Roman Catholic Church, uh, John Thornton, uh, historian of Congo uh, and uh, the African Atlantic world, uh, said the Roman Catholic Church is probably the first global corporation, first global organization in the world. It began to deal with planetary things uh, before anybody, even Portugal. And uh, so the first uh, phase of this new world art uh, was the decolonization of the Catholic Church in Africa. Uh, we had the development of indigenous clergy and an indigenous uh, hierarchy. So we see Cardinal Lorenzi there. 
up at the top is a good Italian guy, Celso Costantini. He developed the idea of number two, uh, cultural pluralism uh, catching hold in the Catholic Church in the 20s and 30s and being formulated with the concept called enculturation of the arts. And uh, so what's behind this neglect? So I came up with, the, through the help of Sally Promi, a wonderful article I quote here, the secularization theory of modernity. Uh, secularization theory contends that modernization necessarily leads to religion's decline, that the secular and the religious will not coexist in the modern world, that religion represents a pre-modern vestige of superstition. That uh, was a long-term idea from the Enlightenment. And here's a, a mural at the Library of Congress, and I can't talk much about it, but quickly uh, you can see uh, it uh, is called Evolution of Civilization, and it sort of starts out with Egypt and written records in this circle, Judea, of course, the Jews, moves around that way, and the progress of mankind eventually comes uh, to the highest level, which is this male American representing science. And so it, it really is the, the future, and religion is to die. Uh, and we have uh, Sally Promi uh, in a prominent article in the Art Bulletin says, art history in the process of canon formation can be seen as an inherently iconoclastic discipline granting standing and thus visibility to some practices and denying it to others. And our friend Deepesh Chakrabarti said one empirically knows of no society in which humans have existed without gods and spirits accompanying them. Although the god of monotheism may have taken a few knocks, if not actually died in the 19th century European story of the disenchantment of the world, the gods and other agents inhabiting practices of so-called superstition have never died anywhere. So, but in Europe we find post-Christian Europe is the term uh, tends to be used because of the collapse of Christian uh, organized religion. There's debates about that. We certainly don't have time to go into it, and that's a little Kevin Carroll nativity set I found recently. There's another problem with uh, Christianity and African art history, and it deals with the missionary stereotype. Uh, it was a very dark one, and uh, wonderful books like Chinua Chebby's book, of course, uh, contributed to this image and there's uh, and the criticism very accurate in many many cases but of course it is um, not the whole picture and that is gradually being rebalanced uh, today uh, JDY Peel, John Peel uh, I'm gonna make it uh, of SOAS uh, has uh, written wonderfully about the origins, the ethnogenesis of the Yoruba people. Christianity is a fully normal part of the African experience uh, and uh, a lot of the scholars who appreciate his work, of course the art historians are not quite there but the anthropologists are. And finally, I have a quote of Picton there, uh, modernity then is not the same as modernity now, and matern modernity there is not the same as modernity here. So we're arguing for multiple modernities. So there's a Christian modernity in Africa and Nigeria, and it includes people like Bandeli and Fakeye, the uh, modernist artists who created Yoruba Christian art. And finally, it's still going on. On the left is uh, work by Lamidi Fakeye from this summer. And on the right is uh, some gorgeous nativity pieces I found in Rome and in Assisi where the Vatican Museum had stamped them in and then neglected them, lost track of them for 50 years. So, thank you. Get out of here. End show. <laughs> Whoops. You can do it, can you?
Okay, that brings us to our next speaker. We have Afe Adogame, who is a lecturer in World Christianities at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, the title of his talk is To God Be the Glory, Home Videos, Art Symbology, and Religio-Cultural Identity in Contemporary African Christianity. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me also join others to express thanks to Sylvester. Yes, because uh, this is a ritual that must be completed. <laughs> yes, um, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, well, um, it seems that uh, I'm more or less an odd person out here because I'm not an art historian, but as an historian of religion, I think it's also necessary to see the, the connection, uh, sometimes maybe using uh, religious studies eyes to look at art or the interconnection between religion and, and art. Uh, what I'm going to share with you uh, came as one minute part of a bigger work I have been doing uh, on African new religious uh, movements. And uh, within this framework, uh, I would like to talk about home videos uh, and how these uh, African uh, churches or religious movements are using this new media uh, for several reasons. The, I will start by just giving you a presentation roadmap. I will start with an introduction. and. Uh, perhaps say very little about the dynamics of media construction and consumption, uh, say very briefly about my specific aims and objectives, and uh, I will go on to talk about home video as expression of contemporary Nigerian popular culture. Then, of course, uh, move on to talk about religious video technology, which I want to use as an example, uh, focusing on uh, one of the movements uh, which I've looked at uh, a bit more closely. Then, of course, uh, I will try to draw uh, at the end narratives of reception and consumption, uh, making use of testimony uh, uh, genres, and, and then uh, conclude. The contemporary global arena is no doubt one that is characterized by a rapid development and convergence of communication technologies in religious, economic, political, and social cultural spheres. Media texts are increasingly serving as one of the significant maps through which African neo religious movements design themselves on local, global, religious landscapes. There has been an unprecedented upsurge in the production, consumption, and commodification of home video films as one specific form of popular culture in Africa and the new African diaspora. Nigerian video films, a phenomenon barely a decade old, are now believed to be produced at the rate of nearly one uh, a day. These video gems uh, perhaps offer one of the most formidable and accessible expression of contemporary Nigerian popular culture. Home video technology represents a basic instance of the interconnected, uh, interconnectedness of the global and the local on the level of cultural marketing, marketing as well as form part of the processes of African modernity. This paper explores how versions of Pentecostal charismatic Christianity are increasingly engaging religious video technology as conduits for the dissemination of their religious ideologies, as a means of developing new visual publics, and as a channel towards negotiating old and new identities. The paper also assesses how and to what extent these alternative strategies impart on old and new emerging publics within Africa and beyond. 
the field of media consumption, in another sense, audience ethnography, has witnessed change, changes in terms of seeking new ways of investigating and interpreting audiences. That is the sense that media consumer, consumers make of the texts and technologies they encounter in everyday life. Sean Moss hints on a problematic concerning our usage of audience and audiences. As he remarks, quote, there's no stable entity which we can isolate and identify as a media audience. No single object that is unproblematically dear for us to observe and analyze, unquote. As he argues, the plural audiences are preferable, denoting several groups divide, divided by their reception of different media and genres or by social and cultural positioning. Yet, even this term presents conceptual difficulties. It's important to deal with the dynamics of media reception by way of looking at media's varied uses and meanings for particular social subjects in particular cultural contexts. One starting point in the attempt to have an adequate account of media consumption is to take seriously the experiences and interpretations of the media constructed by audiences, in another sense consumers, in their everyday routines. We need to reconstruct the consumer's point of view rather than relying on the researcher's imagination. As this paper attempts to demonstrate this approach implicates on our understanding of who consumes what. What audiences can be identified for the media products of the African churches, for instance? Firstly, the consumption of internet and religious home videos is geographically dispersed more than ever before across a multitude of settings. Thus, it becomes harder to specify exactly where the audiences begin and end. Second, the conditions and boundaries of audiencehood are inherently unstable. Both variables are determined by socioeconomic, cultural, and political situations that impact on the various levels of audiences and their existence. Now let me turn to uh, religious video uh, technology. Jeff Haynes aptly remarks that Nigerian video films, a phenomenon less than a decade old, are now being produced at a rate of nearly one a day. As he argues, and I quote, only the daily press and weekly news magazine rival the videos as media for telling the story of Nigeria in the 1990s, and I think that has continued up till now. The videos offer the strongest, most accessible expression of contemporary Nigerian popular culture, which is to say the imagination of Africa's largest nation. They are a prime instance of the interpenetration of the global and the local through the international commerce in cultural terms, and they are a prime instance of African modernity. Partly corroborating the above assertion, Ogundele submits that, and I quote, the ubiquitous presence of the video play in Nigeria, plus its popularity, points to its importance as a new medium for the production, dissemination, and consumption of one specific form of popular culture, with its ideology and aesthetic, unquote. A complex variety of video films now abound within the new emerging video culture that may render a simple categorization as somewhat problematic. While there may bear some similarities in terms of using same local stars or actors, similar scenes or storylines, the themes and paradigms which characterize them as variegated as the titles themselves. And I would even argue that one, commonality, one, one thing that binds all these uh, video, uh, home videos together uh, sometimes is the payoff, what, what I had in my title, to God be the glory. Uh, because you find quite a lot of 
video films today that has nothing to do with religion, no religious symbolism, but they always end with, to God be the glory. And I find this fascinating, especially in trying to understand how religion helps in, in, in the whole process of commodic, commodification of these uh, home videos. Some of their very visible character, uh, particularities are along the ethnic, religious, and sociopolitical dichotomies. A remarkable chunk of this output, this video boom, is what OHA describes as Nigerian Christian videos. It is with one of these burgeoning strands of religious home videos that we are concerned with here. However, it is significant here to begin with a distinction with respect to our categorization of religious videos. There are several genres that may be loosely classified under this rubric. The first refers to movies or religious drama that are written, produced, and pro projected to the general public by religious organizations or ministries, as they call themselves. The second uh, video uh, genre refers to movies that are secular in nature and outlook but which are overtly suffused with religious symbolism and connotations. Another interesting category are the religious musical videos, which can be further classified into what I would call independent local uh, global artists, gospel singers and or choir groups within existing uh, religious groups, musical videos of foreign gospel singers, and lastly what I term crossover gospelers. The growing video documentation and commodification of religious festivals, revivals, services, ritual ceremonies, and other events for both public and private consumption represent yet another uh, level of video films. However, depending on the type, such films are produced, marketed ostensibly for evangelistic uh, reasons, which may be religious, it could be for as a form of entertainment, it could be as a kind of performance, it could be as a kind of recreation on the social level, and it could also be commercial on the economic level. And of course, uh, this could be a combination of all these factors, uh, depending on who is producing. OHA has shown that most of the Christian narratives that make up this video, uh, video plays are situated largely within the locus of spiritual warfare, a, com a kind of conflict between God's forces and malevolent forces. So you always find a lot of this uh, uh, kind of demonizing. If, if it is produced by Christian organization, there's a, a conscious attempt to demonize the indigenous religions, and sometimes maybe Islam, uh, and so on and so forth. As Oha continued, and I quote, such spiritual warfare is made the explanation for human problems such as poverty, disease, childlessness, impotence, barrenness, and divorce. The Christian videos that promote this uh, view are becoming important instruments of evangelization in Nigeria and are shaping attitudes in a social context of fear, uncertainty, helplessness, and hopelessness. It should be noted that the significance which these re religious videos have come to assume is not limited to Nigerians and within Nigeria alone, but is increasingly becoming a household feature among the African diaspora, especially among Nigerians and Ghanaians, for instance, uh, in Europe, North America, and other parts of the world. As Femi Awoni aptly noted, and I quote, video film as an entertainment medium is becoming a bulwark against the much feared cultural repercussion of globalization. The home video culture in Nigeria is transcending the whole continent. Apart from having inspired a similar industry in Ghana and the Gambia, films released in these countries find their way to the other English-speaking countries on the continent and to the African diaspora worldwide. Thus, one primary way through which the, these churches have used the new technologies is through the production and distribution of what has been called the Christian home videos. We shall demonstrate with the case of the Mount Zion Faith Ministries International uh, with headquarters in Nigeria and show how religious video dramas or video movies produced by them 
are consumed locally and internationally by Christians and non-Christians alike. Religious video products are not only largely consumed by Africans in diaspora, they are also partly sponsored, produced, and commodified by them as well. The Mount Zion uh, MZFMI describes itself as a full-time evangelical drama and film ministry whose mission is to evangelize the world through drama. The first Christian mo uh, motion picture made was by the MZFMI in 1994. The relative success of his pioneer film, Agbaranla, generated enough impetus for further works like the English version, Ultimate Power, and The Blood Covenant. These and many other films have become very popular in sub-Saharan uh, Africa through domestic and public screening, as well as among the African diasporic communities. The religious, social, and economic impact of these video gens on the viewers cannot be underestimated. And I will just very quickly illustrate, uh, uh, because I was looking at the website of this uh, uh, of this uh, ministry, and I discovered that there was a section called Testimony Forum. And I'm, I was very much interested in the kind of feedback uh, that we get from viewers. And what I will show you very briefly, uh, I was able to categorize some of these comments into two, uh, a kind of an, a, an ambivalent reaction to some of the films they have watched. So I will uh, quickly show you a few Sorry, I'm going back, I think, yeah. Okay, uh, so this is the, the founder and his wife uh, who are very much involved, uh, not only in the production, but as, as also actors within these uh, uh, so-called uh, movies. And of course, uh, if you look at their website, they talk about how the, the genesis of the whole uh, uh, thing, how they started locally screening within the national television stations, and uh, from then they expanded to Africa and beyond. Uh, you can find quite a lot of their movies uh, uh, across uh, the world today. Uh, Akbar Anla is actually one of those films that shot them into, into fame. And uh, to the, up to today, I mean, people know the name Akbar Anla is synonymous with this uh, group. I don't have time to, to talk much about this. Now, let me just go to the testimony forum, and I'm presenting to you the first batch of, of comments which were more or less very favorable to, to uh, these groups. Uh, for instance, this is a comment from Germany, uh, Chemnitz in Germany. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us Pastor Bamiloye and MZFM. I had the great privilege of talking to an old school principal sometimes who told me that his life has never remained the same after watching the Yoruba film, Agbaranla. I showed the video just a little scene to some of my brethren here in Germany. The Lord has used that video to touch the life of many, both white and black, thanking God for showing the light through Mike Bamiloye. Another commentary from London. Uh, from the first time I watched one of his films, it touched me. The first film I watched was The Ultimate Power, and from then on I started watching the rest. Thank you, Lord, for showing me my uh, Bamiloye. So you have this kind of commentary uh, from one batch of commentators, and that goes on and on. I, I will just keep uh, because of time. Uh, now, but at the same time, it's very interesting to see that there's also a kind of critique by within the, 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 the those who, who watch these movies. And let me give you an example of somebody from Baltimore who uh, was quite amazed uh, the way people were reacting to these films. And they said, MZFM and viewers, be careful lest you miss the complete purpose of God for your lives. Christ has not called you to be watching movies in order to make it into the kingdom of God. He has called each and every soul to seek his face and abide. So it turned polemical here. And uh, if you go on and on, you can see how uh, this you know, raised, generated a whole heated uh, debate and controversy. And here is a reaction from another 
commentator. This message is for Sister Ruth Jesulade. It seems to me that we are not a partaker or in support of the movies. You should understand that the gospel needs to be spread to people in, in any means to expose the works of the devil and so on and so forth. I was a Muslim and I am now a proud Christian, very proud of Jesus and what he's doing through his servants and so on and so forth. And now here is a response again. First of all, Jumi, I'm not your sister in the Lord. This is because I've given my life to Jesus Christ while you have given your life to the Jesus of religion and church. Church or Christianity is not the way to Christ, blah, 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 blah. So he went, uh, she went on. Now here is another kind of middle person trying to mediate between these two. I do not know the genesis of what the two of you are writing about, but I do not think this is the forum for attacking each other. Whatever criticism anyone may have about the films should be directed to Evangelist Mike himself or any other person so designated. You know, then it went on and on. Now, again, it didn't end there. Uh, Jesulade responded, I'm truly on the Lord's side by the grace and mighty hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what you have written does not stand. I have done what the Lord of Lords commanded me to do. So you are wrong about your observation and your comments. Whosoever we attempt to bring damnable heresies uh, and so on and so forth. So the polemics became really uh, acute and uh, I don't have time to, it just, it just continued. <laughs> yes. Uh, you can see this whole conversation, but what I'm quite, uh, yeah, sorry, I will just keep a lot of this. It's a very interesting debate that ensued, you know, between these uh, uh, viewers, and uh, to the point that even the name Jesulade was, was turned to Eshulade, which is like uh, Jesulade, I don't know, is cons uh, together with Jesus, and Eshu is with the devil, you know, so it got to re really this kind of polemics. And uh, what I'm just trying to use this to show is that depending on who is viewing, we have varied you know, uh, ways of reacting. And of course, uh, this, is not, th this kind of polemics is not what the films were intended to convey. But of course, the re at the level of reception, is generating very varied uh, 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 messages. Let me just come to my conclusion. A subsection within the MFM website is devo devoted to testimonies and comments of wide-ranging viewers. The fact that such testimony generates emanate from Africa, Europe, America, and other parts of the world explains the local global nexus these video, uh, home videos have come to assume. However, the successful commodification of home videos in and outside Africa has also drastically reduced the quality of production as well as the cogency of their storylines of messages. Piracy and the absence of effective copyright laws in Nigeria have bedeviled the Bujoni industry. Nevertheless, it is having tremendous influence in shaping African popular culture. By way of conclusion, uh, we have shown how uh, African new religious movements are increasingly uh, uh, appropriating new media technologies in religious communication and transmission to both old and new uh, audiences. It should be mentioned that readers, whether consumers or receivers or audiences, are not passive, but also active dec decoders of texts who will not necessarily accept encoded meanings and positions which are on offer, and as this kind of uh, counter has uh, demonstrated. Depending on the religious, socioeconomic, and, and cultural uh, situation that media consumers already occupy, the text preferred interpretation may in certain instances be negotiated or even refused entirely. And this was uh, brought out quite clearly here. So I would uh, conclude by saying that Religious video technology and the internet, uh, to a large extent, serve as a complementary uh, vehicle. Of course, it does not replace the other mediums uh, which these churches have been using uh, prior to the emergence of, of uh, uh, video uh, technology. Let me just uh, end by uh, just showing you one minute uh, a clip uh, about this, these churches. It's a, 
or this program they have. Let me see. I hope I can. Okay. Is there sound? Yeah. Okay. Make sure it's. I working. hope. At the Covenant Child comes another heart touching, inspiring, and evangelical video movie. Back to Zero Point, a tale of sorrow and regret, a story of a portion of impatience and haste. When one is bent on having his own way and going his own direction, disregarding the will of God, it amounts to going back to Zero Point. Written and produced by Mike Pamiloye, directed by Evan Jarek and Mike Pamiloye. Back to Zero Point, a film every child of God must watch. A film every home must have. Starring Julia Pamiloye, Shadia Bola, Leroy Otetele, Edward Jarrett, and Mike Pamiloye. Back to Zero Point. Available from Mozambique Media Connection, 48 of Avenue, Wunawa, Ikeja, Randabawa, telephone 080 and 16 Elizabeth Road, near Kuku Medica, Mokola, Ibadan. Yeah, sorry, I, I don't really have time to show you clips uh, to see this kind of encounter, this whole process of demonization that, that you find uh, very conspicuous in this kind of uh, uh, films that uh, are becoming more and more very popular within the Nigeria uh, context. Let me stop there. Thank you very much. Well, as they say, perhaps we've saved the best for last. <laughs> we have um, our final speaker for today is Professor Hakim Abderazak. Uh, he's assistant professor of literature and cinema at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. And he'll be talking about Morocco's modernity, an exploration through literature, cinema, and culture. Thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, complete fully the, um, the ritual by uh, thanking Sylvester for inviting me. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here, uh, to be here today. Um, in my presentation, I will first be concerned with uh, literary works and more precisely with uh, Dries Sharbi's Le Passé Simple and Mohamed Choukri's uh, Le Pain Nu. These two novels will uh, be a point of entry for my argument about Moroccan um, literary modernity. And the second part of my talk, which is something that I added to make it, um, to kind of broaden my uh, argument, I will deal with other works which will be mostly of cinematic nature. Uh, I will use these to engage uh, Maghrebi modernity at large. And I, um, I uh, understand Maghrebi in the French sense, meaning, um, well, even though it's not a French word, but I mean uh, Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. Um, but first, let me start my presentation by asking the following question. What does modernity mean? By asking this question, I'm posing a linguistic question. What does modernity mean? The Arabic language considers the question the same way. Ma ma'ana l'asriya. In French, one would ask the question this way, qu'est-ce qu'on entend par modernité, which translates literally as one does one hear by saying modernity. Al-Asriya is the word used in modern standard Arabic, MSA, a prescribed form of Arabic allowing for the invention of terms that, identity, uh, that identify modern products and concepts. Al-Asriya is an expression found in formal contexts and in specialized discourses, but average Moroccans have their own terminology to refer to the modern environment that surrounds them. I will deal here with Moroccan modernity, or rather what Moroccans hear when modernity says its name. In other words, I will investigate Moroccans' understanding of modernity in their daily usage of the term and not what modernity implies in the Occident. I will therefore dwell on colloquial Arabic, which I believe is crucial to an, an understanding of how modernity affects Moroccan and Maghrebi societies. This will allow me to assess the approach of modernity taken by those who have been subjected to it in the 20th century, that is at the time of colonization, decolonization, immigration, globalization, and all types of subsequent social and historical events. Indeed, the encounter between the Arab Islamic world and modernity is a recent and brutal one as writer and thinker 
uh, uh, Tunisian writer and thinker, Abdel Wahab Maddeb says, um, I will quote the French and then give you the uh, uh, English translation which, which is uh, provided in um, uh, Andrea Khalil's book uh, entitled The Arab Avant-Garde. Fonder un lieu dans la modernité continue à être pour moi un souci majeur. Un Européen né d'une manière naturelle dans la modernité. Or, quand on est issu d'une généalogie arabe et islamique, le lien est occulté. La tradition s'absente. La modernité n'advient pas comme une opération logique, historique. La modernité est une intrusion chaotique et subie. To establish a place in modernity continues to be a major concern for me. A European is born naturally into modernity. But, one, but when one is from an Arab and Islamic genealogy, the place is a cult. The tradition is absent. Modernity does not appear as a logical, historical operation. Modernity is a chaotic and oppress, oppressive intrusion. End of quote. Moroccans call all that which is modern, modern. They use a French word in their conversations in Arabic about modern artifacts and behavior, or rather they use in colloquial Arabic a word that has, that has become Arabic but is originally French. The inclusion of French words in Arabic is a consequence of French colonization in this part of Africa and subsequent edu educational programs in French in implemented by independent Morocco. But it is also the evidence of a daily engagement of Moroccans with modernity that transpires in the language. This appropriation cannot go unnoticed. It raises a question of whether or not it reflects the violence of the encounter with modernity at various stages of the contact between the Maghreb and France. Modernity is a source of concern for linguists who face the urgent necessity of inventing Arabic words to designate the products, machines, and processes generated by modern technological advances. It has been the task of experts to impose the naming of modern objects and concepts in modern standard Arabic for the entire Arabic. Arab world. Even though a usual practice is to come up with words that are very close to the usage in the, in the West, such as demokratia for democratic, technologia, uh, technologia for technology, it is still validated by the debate and consensus of scholars. It is also legitimized through its official adoption by dictionaries, such as Lisan al Arab, a prominent lexicon of the Arab world. Contrastingly, the language of the street escapes any systematic regulation. It takes the form of an endless recycling, which has proved to be at times a felicitous and inevitable endeavor, as it allows Maghrebis to fill a linguistic void on the street and at home. Indeed, no one is in charge of the task of naming for literates, uh, concepts, and all sorts of foreign elements that modern times have uh, put into circulation. The near impossibility of writing and thus reading in colloquial Arabic caused by a strict ban imposed by national authorities in each of the Maghrebi countries is responsible for spontaneous and unorig unoriginal linguistic recycling. I, I argue that the latest state of Sabir, that is the variety of language spoken in the Maghreb that has directly borrowed from the languages of former colonizers such as France and Spain, but also from the current linguistic and cultural regional domination of French, Spanish, Italian, and now English, is a mere product of modernity. Medeb has a similar take on the question, as Khalil uh, shows in her study of the author's te uh, text or work, I should say. Medeb is conscious, uh, and I'm quoting her, Madeb is conscious of this contradiction, communication, and interruption of the conditions of cultural modernity in the Maghreb. For this reason, he acknowledges Arab origin through the languages and cultures that have infiltrated the Maghreb throughout history. End of quote. This recycling that is grafted onto Arabic words and incorporated in what I would call, I would like to call post-colonial Arabic has detrimental corollaries. Indeed, for one, it avoids a deep engagement with the cultural and hegemonic implications that such a faithful, direct, and unfiltered appropriation implies. Second, it is responsible for a constant impov impoverishment of the language. Finally, the adoption of foreign words often leaves behind the multi-semantism of concepts which were originally invested with a single or specific meaning but came to suffer a distortion or an excess of meaning as a disorderly conceptual hodgepodge. A case, a case in point is modern, which is not only associated with the West, but this concept is also understood as al-moda, that is, what is modish, fashionable, from the French à la mode. 
and therefore what is to be sought after. It enables Moroccan youth to be um, themselves as part of a global community, the one that grants uh, membership to those who adopt its values and products, that is its materialism and capitalism and related behaviors such as bodily narcissism um, and modern isms that value the superficial aspect of things and the um, fetishism, fetishism and objectific object oh, <laughs> objectification of the non-material. The phonetic vicinity between modern and a la mode or modern and moda may explain why Moroccans and Algerians alike have been led to make a questionable link between modernity and fashion. Fashion suggests the latest trends. Is modernity uh, not what is new? Modernity is always post-traditional. It is interesting that in MSA, what is Asri or modern is also recent, uh, I'm quoting the dictionary, uh, recent, present, actual, contemporary, modernist. Consequently, it is not rare to hear people be called modern or traditional depending on the way they dress, thus reducing to a monolithic view ideological positions to a du dualism between tradition and modernity. The strong divide is an outrageously um, as outrageously generalized and stereotyped as it is geographically confined, the city being the locus of modernity, that is the place where contacts with the West are to be witnessed. It is where, mo it is where Western clothes are more common, traditional garb being increasingly relegated at the margins of the police or Medina. In the light of the theory of modernity as systematic association with the West, modern people and uh, this is uh, between quotes, speak French. Moroccan women who were raised in the Maghreb who identify with Western values do not simply dress in Western fashion, but also in Western language. They use French in their daily lives, even in their conversations with compatriots, thereby accentuating their own difference within the Moroccan frame or reference of reference. This endeavor is at heart a declaration of modernism. Contemporary controversial debates surrounding the wearing of the herd scarf in Muslim countries have, have presented uh, this act as the claiming of a voluntary or not voluntary uh, return to tr traditional values in a modern environment. But the constant use of French in Morocco or Algeria is a profession not of faith but of modernism. On the editorial page of his journal, uh, Tengis, a Moroccan-American magazine of ideas and culture now only available online, Anwar Majid, uh, Majid uh, writes, I did enjoy reading quite a few novels by Moroccan writers in the past, but somehow Moroccan fiction in any language has sounded to me as if it were a copy of some other literature, as if the sensibility that runs through its veins, its veins were somehow a simulacrum of another national or cultural experience. Even Mohamed Choukri, my compadre from Tangier, sounded somehow foreign as if he were Jean Genet in Moroccan clothing, living on the exotic edges of a society that, that I inhabited, but which was decidedly out of reach." End of quote. Shukri's work is criticized for being mere mimicry of Western literature in which traditional Moroccan storytelling inevitably aligns itself to French um, literary t standards. In 1967, Abdel Latif Lahabi wrote in the review Souffle, uh, and I'm quoting him, La seule publication de ce livre a doté la littérature marocaine de sa première œuvre moderne parce qu'elle s'affirme en comparaison de toute la production contemporaine comme une œuvre d'une précieuse nouveauté. Uh, the publication of the single book, symbol simple past, endowed Moroccan literature with its first modern work because it contrasts with all contemporary production as a valuably novel work." End of quote. In a similar vein, Abdullah Abdel Smaya qualifies Shraibi as a precursor and a commenceur, a pioneer and a starter. We are thus compelled to ask ourselves what the passé simple and le pain nu have in common that generate stark criticism in one case and enthusiastic praise in the other and make both of them the pillars of Moroccan modernity. Simple past takes place in a bourgeois family living in Fez, the imperial and cultural capital of Morocco. In Le Panu, an extremely poor family leaves Nador, a city in northeast Morocco, which is devastated by famine, and it settles uh, in Tangier and in, Alger Alger in Algeria to flee misery. Despite their differences, uh, both novels and are fierce criticisms of the father figure. In both works, the sons, who are the narrators, advocate the refusal of the law of the father, the latter being extremely violent. Both fathers are responsible for the death of close family members. 
These works, which the authors like to call biographies, feature patriarchal themes that move to and outmoded laws of patriarchy. A passage from Simple Past encapsulates the debate in a discussion between father and son on the cloth of the latter, a suit. The, the latest trend in Moroccan dress. In the context of pre-independent Morocco, this adds another layer to the issue, that of end endorsement of Western values, which the author was strongly accused of holding for years and which supposedly was the cause of the censorship of his novel in Morocco. What else does the first Moroccan modern novel advocate besides a systematic refusal of the law of the father and a wish for the modernization of the country. It certainly speaks in favor of individualistic values that the revolt against the communitarian system entails. The emergence of the project shows and the rendering of the unbearable weight of the community that is tied up in the Father who is called Le Seigneur, the Lord. Contrary to common criticism, I argued that the heated debates surrounding Schreiber's novel were not fueled by the controversial ideological and political positions attributed to the writer. Rather, they were driven by, driven by his call for individualism in a time of needed political cohesion. Becoming modern easily equates to becoming other. The political treason this undertaking constitutes in colonial Morocco is still treason, but of an ideological kind in later works written long after the colonial rule, such as in the case of uh, 1998 uh, work, Chronique d'un enfant du Hammam, the author, Karim Nasseri, is another Moroccan writer who comes up with a story of a youth hated by his father, who he calls the dictator, the dictator. The latter um, also hates his wife, whom he insults as vulg vulgarly as the narrator's father in Le Panu. The child strongly hopes for his death in Chronique d'un enfant du Hammam and in its sequel entitled Noces et Funérailles. In his two novels, the reader senses a similar condemnation of traditional values by his setting of the first story in rural Morocco and staging hopes in the second uh, story for a better future in Oujda, a city in northeastern Morocco that is more open to modern changes. Arabic names are traditionally coined after professions or places of origin. One could have it, uh, as a last name the butcher, the baker, or the inhabitant of uh, Casablanca or Marrakesh if he is uh, the descendant of a butcher or baker or if his um, ancestors are from Casablanca or Marrakesh. This type of naming is misleading since I may not live in Marrakesh and still be called Marakshi. This process of wrongly revealing an identity is shared by another traditional pattern of naming, which is in fact one of unnaming or obliter uh, obliterating identity by calling a child the son or daughter of the father, ben, son of, bent, da daughter of. This, uh, this procedure was very much in place before the adoption of modern ways of identification introduced in the Maghreb by the French. The traditional name system is often viewed by city dwellers as being outdated, a remnant of pre-modern era still in place in parts of the Maghreb that have escaped the touch of modernity. This reflection is tied to the notion of subjectivity, the Trojan horse of Moroccan modern liter literature. Dari Shraibi encouraged his readership to make a parallel between him and his character as they both have the same name. It is a, bra a brave manifesto, so to speak, which gives more weight to the thesis of a personal endorsement of his character's ideas, who in turn is presented as the mouthpiece of the author's ideas and revolutionary stand against his country, culture, institutions, and heavy traditions. The main character in Nasseri's novels is named Idris. Dari Shraibi's character is called Dris. The elongation of the name Idris shows a continuation of the revolt of Dris, Dris character. Indeed, Dris comes from the Arabic tri trilateral root darasa, which refers to the learning process. Idris could be interpreted as the one who is currently learning, since the prefix i is the form used for the third person in the present tense. What could Idris be learning if not the revolt of Dris, his teaching? Uh, using his tools to become another, a modern subject. Here it is important to emphasize that Dres's last name is Ferdi, which means individual, individualist, individualistic, a modern characteristic commonly opposed to traditional attributes such as communitarianism. Therefore, Ferdiya, or individualism, subjectivity, seems to inscribe itself as a modern, foreign, new concept. Its entry in the reference dictionary Listen al Arab as late as the 19th century also presented as being a Western notion convincingly, convincingly supports this theory. 
I would like to approach McGravy Cinema by trying to understand what makes a, crit uh, a critic qualify North African films as modern works and will then draw some conclusions. To this end, I have chosen to talk about Viva l'Algérie, an Algerian film by Nadir Mokhnesh, which came out in 2004. Viva l'Algérie uh, has been a successful film in France and the United States. Its strong interest in the West was seen in the awarding of numerous prizes. On the other hand, its reception in Algeria was mixed. It both attracted and appalled the Algerian public, critics, and political officials who saw it. Why praise in the West and discontent in North Africa? Certainly it was due to its novel way of portraying female sexuality. A renowned French historian Benjamin Stora reminds us in an interview that comes with the Viva Paca package um, that Arab cinema has never before featured full frontal nudity nor addressed taboo subjects such as alcoholism with such boldness. The cover of the American uh, version of the film presents the Meknesian female characters as being modern. It f further uses uh, related adjectives such as emancipated. The way the director depicts sexuality and the way the female characters expose their bodies and engage in their sexuality on the big screen account for such critics' accounts. Thierry Leclerc held the film using, using the following terms. Viva l'Algérie est le premier film de l'histoire du cinéma algérien à montrer des scènes de nu. Viva Algeria is the first film in the history of Algerian cinema to show nude, nude scenes. End of quote. Is exposure of uh, female nudity a modern behavior, a sign of it, or a condition? In Moknesh's film, it seems to be a combination of a number of choices. It is entirely in French, though it, it, it takes place in Algeria. The cast is Arabophone, and therefore shooting in Arabic would have been possible. The director explained his preference for the French language by saying that it would be ridiculous to make Lubna Azabal speak in her Moroccan Arabic. Moroccan and Algerian Arabic dialects are very similar, and the difference in the accent is not normally not noticed by Westerners who constitute the major part of the sp spectatorship. But the training of Lubna Azabal was a feasible project. She was coached to speak some Spanish in another film entitled Exil. Could it, be, uh, could it simply have been a marketing and materialist driven choice, the sign of a modern preoccupation shared by filmmakers from across geographical borders? The p popularity of French television is here demonstrated and its uh, availability locally via, via satellite dishes accounts for such a, a favoritism. One is considered modern as a consumer of French culture or North African culture rendered in French. It is a way of being up to date, hip, or um, of adhering to a community of sorts linked by air. Uh, by way of conclusion, I would like to ask, is modernity avoidable, preferable, regrettable, or acceptable? Modernity in the Arab Muslim context has raised many questions. The growing number of books published each year on the subject in many languages across the world attest to the actuality of a global phenomenon. The Maghrebi legacy of a colonial past and its current position at the crossroads of continents make the return to traditional ways impossible. The most conservative and critical times did not put an end to modernist hopes within a certain portion of the Maghrebi population. Mokhnesh's film shows that modern comportments are deeply rooted in traditional environments in the form of a bricolage or rather filmic collage as if um, as it is the case uh, in a particularly interesting scene w when uh, modern Fifi the prostitute and Goussem the emancipated woman go visit a fortune teller in their traditional Mansouri and Hayek. Under these most traditional articles of clothing, they show their skins and hide a cell phone in a country where exposed skin is equated with um, nakedness. I'll show a one minute <laughs> um, ex um, scene and then uh, um, Un peu beaucoup, non Demain, qu'est-ce que tu fais Je travaille. C'est pas grave. Demain, je t'emmène voir une grande dame. Oh, oui. mmh. Elle va tout te dire sur ton ceci. Elle peut même te le transformer en toutou. Elle va te manger dans la main. 
T'as qu'à lui dire que ta mère s'est cassée une jambe. Tiens, prends mon portable. Tu l'appelles et tu lui dis. Comment ça marche ah, Tu oui. vas tout apprendre. Hein. Mais c'est vrai, monsieur Moufoc, elle a glissé sur une pierre. Elle a trois points de suture. Merci, monsieur Moufoc. And I'll jump to the another scene where um So in this scene you see that the, the haik, which is the white garb, is actually um, not um, covering the whole body as it should be uh, and according to uh, um, one of the uh, assistant to the uh, director it was just made by chance because there was some wind that day but it's kind of uh, it fits into the film where the woman is always um, exposing her body uh, and uh, the the cell phone which she uh, takes from um, um, her basket uh, is here to replace um, or to um, provide an alternative speech to the uh, traditional discourse of conservative Algerians. Uh, the cell phone uh, in the scene uh, represents the strong Western presence and the term phonetically close to modern or modern and almoda, namely the media. The notion of the hybridity of language, the theme of rupture, of rupture with the father and the exposed body as signs of the eruption of modernity all point to an essential question about the reduction of modernity precisely to these signs. At the same time, there are indications of a profound transformation that would or could produce another modernity, but of which kind? Thank you. I have a, a question for Afi. I was kind of thinking about in these Christian videos part of the message as you explained it was kind of it's a struggle, a spiritual struggle between good which is the Christian God, the Christian way, evil, a lot of demonization and the demonization is often connected with indigenous religion, I don't know whether you said yeah. Islam, but perhaps also Islam, and I was wondering, as part of this, this demonization, what kind of language is being used? Is the language being used of quote-unquote tradition, or of what Moya just talked about, but in a different context, um, quote-unquote primitive? So how does this demonization work by engaging with the indigenous? What kind of language is being used to do that? Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, unfortunately, there was not opportunity to show clips, you know, to show the kind of rhetoric uh, which is usually uh, uh, used. But I think it becomes clear that, I mean, from a lot of these examples, uh, the demonization process is usually an encounter between Christianity, not, not all brands of Christianity, but largely Pentecostal Christianity versus the indigenous forms of, 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 uh, of religion. And of course, this question of fetishism and all that, you know, these are rhetorics that are, that are used. But uh, I think, on the other hand, uh, you find less of this kind of demonization uh, because you also have religious video films that are not Christian. You don't have, I mean, uh, we have local, more of Yoruba films, for instance, you know, that try to portray that, well, the traditional religion, the Yoruba religion is not, is not bad, it's not as, as terrible as it is painted, but it does not, you know, do exactly what the Pentecostal Christians would do. And of course, there's not much kind of demonization on the level of Christianity to Islam. 
it's more on the level of Christianity to to the indigenous religion. And any, I mean, the MZ, um, this group I have shown, today they have over 25 to 30 movies. And each one, you know, replicates this kind of dichotomy between, oh, we are the good, this is the, this is the, the bad, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. My question is for Hakeem. <clears throat> I just wanted a bit of a clarification. You were using the word, the word moda. Is that, and then I heard a la mode and fashionable and, and so we were talking about modern. So is moda an Arabic, a colloquial Arabic term for modern or fashion or both? And my other question is, in this cinematic and literary context that you were talking about, context, it's plural, um, is modern always equal to Western? I mean, here you have the hike blowing up, so it's concealing that's not the, the concealer that's not concealing, and obviously cell phones are not, you know, Western. But just some of the critiques that you talked about made it sound like if you wear a suit and question patrimonial values. Anyway, that's my question. Yeah, uh, to answer your first question, um, the moda is um, is uh, is for la mode, the fashion, and uh, it's not an Arabic word because it comes from the the French word, but it's kind of Arabicized, if you want, um, like a lot of words in colloquial Arabic where you just take the French word and you make it sound, um, you appropriate it, and it becomes something very close to the French, like uh, modern being just modern, just you have to roll the R. Uh, <laughs> um, and to answer your second question, um, of course, it's, uh, uh, I don't want to make this link between, you know, what is modern is Western, uh, but uh, it, it is, well, it, it is carried out in the language. Uh, when people say in the Maghreb, this is modern, what they imply is that it's Western, um, even if it's not necessarily Western, but something that you, that comes from um, the other side of the, the uh, of the Mediterranean, and they also mean that it's new, something that you would not call something modern if it came from uh, the beginning of the century, and you would not call something modern if it uh, was made um, in Morocco. Uh, for example, if you take the since we talked about fashion, if you talk about the um, the way uh, women dress, so usually you know they're dressed uh, with the long garbs, but in Morocco it's kind of uh, uh, different because you could walk with a skirt if you want. But if you choose to uh, to wear the long garb, which is called jellaba, um, now it's not worn to hide your body as it used to be before. It is a way for uh, to to um, to make your body look better. The jalabas, yeah, absolutely. And they could actually stop at the knees. Uh, they are more and more uh, um, jalabas now where uh, the, 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 the modern is uh, incorporated where you have, uh, f I mean, the, the, the French fashion getting into the Moroccan fashion in a way. And a lot of uh, French um, shows that Moroccans see and they take what they want from it and make uh, Moroccan fashion modern. And what they call by modern is what they actually see um, happen happening uh, in Europe most of the time. Yeah. Did I answer all your questions? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh -huh. you know, which is a more traditional garment, and yet it's been modernized slash westernized. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and also if you take the, because there were two words that I used for modern, the modern, which is the uh, the colloquial one, and asri, uh, asriya, which is uh, the um, modern standard Arabic word, so the word that you could use from Morocco to Asia. And uh, it's uh, this word, if you look at the, the one of the most prominent dictionaries uh, for Arabs that is read by uh, I mean, again, from Morocco to Asia, you will see this translation. Um, I mean, the words that are given are contemporary, uh, uh, new, um, things that tend to 
go along the idea um, that Moroccans sometimes have that modern is Western, even if it's, uh, of course, very controversial, but this is the way the language carries this uh, thinking. Nick, the, uh, the material you dug up on this Oye Kitty thing is actually extraordinary. But I'm even more uh, impressed by the, the sculptures uh, that were clothed by the, the, the ones you said you found in the Vatican. Oh, yes. Is there any chance in our lifetime that the Vatican will actually <laughs> open up its, <laughs> its collection for analysis? That's a, that's a great question. I, I don't have the answer to it. But I think somewhere. So. I found two nativity sets. One was, and these were from 1950. I found one at a lay Catholic organization's museum in Assisi. And I found one by going in the back door of the Vatican. Uh, on a very long, I could write a long article that would be very entertaining, kind of a travel log about how I ended up inside the Pontifical Urbaniana University inside the back door of Vatican City. And the guy ha happened, he, he was digging up old books, Cardinal uh, Costantini, old 1930s books for me. And he said, what's that picture? And I had a picture of those kings that nobody's seen for 50 years. And I said, well, blah, blah, blah. And I told him all about uh, Oye Kitty. And he says, just a minute, he disappeared. Five minutes later, he came back. He went down three stories. He came back, follow me. And I followed him into some little parlor in another part of the university on a table. And there were three kings from the very first Kevin Carroll set that were ever made, carved by Bandelli, a garb by Mrs. Ojo, you saw her, uh, hats by Adetoye, uh, the beaded headdresses, these fantastic pieces, two, two foot tall statue, I mean significant pieces. Uh, he said, I said, when, <laughs> how long have these been here? And he said, since I came to work here. And he was my age, and I said, when did you, in 1966. So they simply, nobody knows. So I've, I'm going back. <laughs> and there's more to find. So I just, anyway, it's pretty exciting. What's that? Yes. Yes. Oh, there's every piece, the one up in Assisi, they were all stamped on the bottom with an accession number. But you know that the Vatican didn't know where, you know, where they actually were. They, yes, we signed them in. <laughs> and then after that, and only the kings were present. The Holy Family was gone. And I can spin out a lot of reasons, like somebody who doesn't like the indigenous blending with Christianity, didn't like the kings, but liked Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, or vice versa. Uh, the kings were okay and they burned the, you know, I mean, there's so many reactions possible. Uh, but the librarian, who I will contact again, said, I'm going to look around. Because he thinks some faculty priest popped them into his room or, you know, who knows where they went. One question for the thing. Actually, Philippi wrote extensively about those pieces and said they were really important. Yes, I know that debate, yeah. Yes. Well, he, he had his idea of what was modern, and uh, Christian stuff didn't fly. Yeah, definitely. Well, with that, Thank you. With that last comment, I think we can officially uh, conclude our, our final panel, and I know that um, we're now going to hand the floor back to Sylvester for some closing remarks. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> this has been an extraordinary experience for me, uh, putting this panel together, but more importantly, realizing from the very first paper that we have something truly extraordinary going on here. I am very grateful to all of you for sticking it out, for, for coming down here, um, and for you know, all the diligent work that's gone into the preparation of the program. We will have just one more thing to do before we break, uh, and that would be to gather together in front here for a group uh, TV shot so we can all be seen quite clearly. I want to conclude this conference by asking uh, the conference assistant manager, Dennis Rothwell, to please take a bow. Without her, this would not have been possible. Um, 
So here we are then. Um, it is done, and I'm very grateful to all of you for making this reality, a vi uh, this vision a reality. Uh, Mr. Mbanefo, I read an email from him a few minutes ago in which he said I should please on his behalf thank all of you very seriously. He is also very grateful that you are all uh, able to make this event and you know to give it the honor it deserves. Uh, thank you very much and please do not hesitate to contact me. We will be getting in touch with you with more information about other things as we go along. We intend to publish the proceedings and are already talking seriously with a publisher. Finally, um, a few of the ladies have said they want to take me out and buy me some martinis. So if you would like to, <laughs> if you'd like to join us, you know, I, I, don't, I don't drink, so you can have my martini as it comes, you know, you're welcome. Thank you very much and a round of applause for all of us.